Welcome to Conversations Live. For more than a decade, we've brought you the best in books, entertainment, celebrity interviews, and current events. When the movers and shakers of the world have something to say to you, they say it to us first. Now celebrating 17 years of broadcasting success, here's your host, Cyrus Webb. And welcome back, everyone, to Conversations Live. I'm your host, Cyrus Webb. Glad you all could join us once again, both for our audience in Mississippi at WYAD 94.1 FM and WYADonline.com. We're glad that you all could be with us. Also, those tuning in through iHeartRadio and Amazon Music Podcast, we're glad you all could join us as well. Well, I think this last year has really taught us that clinical trials are responsible for many groundbreaking advances used to treat all types of diseases and conditions, with some resulting in the discovery of life-saving treatments and even drugs. Well, the same is true when it comes to cancer. Nearly all of today's standard treatments are based on previous clinical trials. With that being said, though, there is still skepticism and some misconceptions when it comes to these clinical trials and who best benefits from them. Here to help us to kind of clear out some of those myths, we're excited to welcome from the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, Leah Zumida, as well as patient advocate Mel Mann. We're going to talk to the two of them, not only about these misconceptions, but also the benefits that can come from them. Leah, Mel, thank you so much for the time. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Leah, I'll start with you. I mean, I think one of the big things when I was prepping for this segment, we do hear so much out there when it comes to clinical trials, you know, who's involved in them. What are some of the misconceptions that you all have heard, and, and, and what has it been like for you to be able to dispel those? Sure. So, you know, one of the common um, myths about clinical trials is that people who enroll in them are guinea pigs. And, you know, you're going to be able to hear um, Mel's amazing story, but I will just say that safety is really top priority in a clinical trial. Um, it's a carefully controlled research study by, um, conducted by doctors and researchers with the goal of safely improving the care and treatment of people with cancer. So trials are designed with very specific safety measures to make sure that they're giving people the, the safest and most effective clinical therapies. And every clinical therapy protocol has stringent safety measures that must be followed um, throughout the course of the clinical trial. Um, another common uh, misconception is that a clinical trial is only for someone who's exhausted all of their treatment options. And that's mm-hmm. something else that's not true. There are clinical trials available for every stage of a disease, um, for people who are newly diagnosed who have never started treatment yet, um, to people whose cancer maybe didn't respond to treatment or came back, but there are even clinical trials for people who are in remission. And so when you hear about Mel's story, it's a really great example of why clinical trials should really be discussed very early in diagnosis and at each change in treatment plan because they are a really great potential option for people. Yeah. Mel, I really appreciate you being on with us today, uh, as well as Leah, uh, to talk to us about this. So if you don't mind, Mel, tell us a little bit about your own experience when it comes to being a part of clinical trials. Well, so I, was, I was diagnosed with terminal leukemia 26 years ago, and I was given just three years to live. And I was in the Army, and I was living up in Michigan with my wife and our five-year-old daughter. And the only cure was a bone marrow transplant, but I was unable to find a donor and I, I did numerous bone marrow drives. And so about halfway in my, into my diagnosis, a, a businessman with a different type of leukemia, he approached me at a drive, and he suggested that I give clinical trials a try. So I entered uh, several clinical trials, and at the three-year mark, I was still, uh, you know, my, my leukemia was getting worse. So around the three-and-a-half-year mark, I entered a clinical trial on a drug called Gleevec, and the drug worked. And I was able to run a 26.2 mile marathon nine months after starting the clinical trial. And uh, three years later, at the FDA approved uh, Gleevec. And uh, my daughter grew up, uh, went to Harvard, and she became a doctor. And I'm still here 26 years later. That, that's amazing. Mel, I really appreciate you sharing that. One of the things that Leah mentioned, I think it's important for our audience to hear, is, and she mentioned that, you know, some people think it's just for those who have exhausted all the other standard treatment options. At the place when you first got involved with clinical trials, had you exhausted all of your other options? Well, you know, I, I did not know about treatment options until I started clinical trials about halfway through my, my treatment. And okay. so um, I, would, I would say I would I'd just stress the importance of patient-doctor communication, and you know, I was still eligible for clinical trials, but the options um 
uh, the current options were not uh, were not going to save me. I still had that three year time uh, clock ticking down. Right. Well, Leah, male story is really remarkable, and it shows, of course, the importance uh, of these clinical trials. I love the fact that he also mentions that communication with the doctors. Uh, one of the other things that I noticed when I was prepping for this segment is that and we hear a lot about this, even with the in the pandemic. We hear about placebos uh, versus the actual treatment. Talk to us about that, Leah, and 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 how that works, and and how that's kind of decided. Sure. So there are lots of people who are concerned about getting a placebo or some sort of inactive medication in a clinical trial. And and what I really want to stress to you today is that most clinical um, cancer clinical trials do not use a placebo unless it's given along with an active drug or what we call standard of care therapy. So it's really important to understand that no patient will only receive a placebo in a blood cancer clinical trial. It would be completely unethical. Um, If a trial does include a placebo, and again, that would be in combination with another active treatment, um, patients are aware that that's a possibility um, when they're going through the informed consent process before they begin a trial. It's really good information, Leah, and I'm so glad you could join us here from the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society to help us debunk some of these myths. And Mel, I really appreciate you sharing your story with us today, and I hope it inspires other people to to look at this as an option for them. Leah, where can our audience go for more information? That's a great question. So, um, you know, it's the clinical trial uh, process is complicated, and so the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society has the Clinical Trial Support Center, and we're a team of nurse navigators with special expertise in blood cancer. We can help patients or their family members identify potential clinical trials, overcome the barriers to enrollment, and then provide support through the whole the entire process. And the, the best way to learn more about us or your diagnosis or other financial resources that might be available to you is to call the Information Resource Center at LLS. And their number is one 800 and the IRC specialists are waiting to take your call. Um, They have uh, an unbelievable amount of knowledge and ability to help you, and there are bilingual specialists who are waiting as well, and they can send you along to us in the clinical trial navigation um, department to help you as well. Um, You can also visit our website at lls.org for more information, and you can also do live chat or email from that website. No, that is amazing. Leah, Mel, again, thank you so much for this time and for this valuable information. And Mel, definitely thank you for the the encouraging you know, part of your story because I think it's really going to help so many. And looking forward to having the two of you back on the program again. Oh, thank you, Faris. Thank you. Have a great day. And you as well. And we thank your audience for tuning in to another great segment of Conversations Live. Until next time, I'm your host, Cyrus Webb, saying as always, enjoy your day, enjoy your life, enjoy your world. Thank you all for choosing Conversations Live. Now let's go make today amazing. Take care.